The content of this podcast is based on medical fact and evidence-based practice from credible authoritative sources, but is not a substitute for your institution's policies, procedures, common sense, or good judgment. The views and opinions are those of Eric Bauer and Flight Bridge Ed in their entirety. This is the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, critical care and emergency medicine education for nurses and paramedics. Here's your host, Eric Bauer. Hey everybody, this is Eric back with you. Today we're going to do an interview podcast and we're going to have a, a guest with us, uh, Alan Wolf. Um, Alan Wolf is the current president of the Air and Surface Transport Nurse Association. Alan's been a, a great mentor for me over the last three or four years and, and it's, a, it's a pleasure to have him as a guest on the Flatbridge Ed podcast. Well, thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, man. Um, why don't you tell the listeners, and we have you know listeners all over the world, tell the listeners kind of who you are, your experience, and, and uh, what you currently do in the HEMS industry. Uh, well, as Eric mentioned, my name is Alan Wolf. Presently, I'm the director of education for Air Methods. Uh, Air Methods is the largest air medical provider in the world uh, for EMS. Um, we have about 140 five bases, and I'm responsible for the 1,150 flight nurses and flight um, paramedics continuing education. Um, I have been flying for about, uh, in the flight industry, and flying for probably about 27 years. I've been a nurse probably about 31 years. My my background uh, as a nurse, I have, I've never been a paramedic, you know, I've never been a paramedic. I worked in the hospital, except when I went to the flight part of it. So my experience uh, is all in a hospital. I started in uh, um, ICUs. Uh, first, I was on the floor. Can you believe it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> a little med surge. <laughs> it, it was a uh, surgical floor, telemetry at a great hospital in suburban Washington, D.C. I just loved it, loved it, loved the people. And from there, I got the bug to go into critical care. So I went to the critical care of this small um, hospital. And I was there two years, and so I wanted to go to a, a bigger hospital. And this time when I went to a bigger hospital, still in the suburbs, I went to uh, Fairfax Hospital. Um, that's where Dick Cheney had his LVAT put in, <laughs> you know, 30, 25 years later. Um, but I worked there in a CVICU. So I went from a regular ICU in a small hospital to a uh, CVICU. And that's where the bug of cardiovascular nursing kind of hit me. And I was there probably about three years, and uh, I kind of wanted to get into some a- there's more action. So I start working in the city, and in, in, you know, in a city, you see a lot more of interesting things. I say interesting because uh, when you work in the inner city, a lot of people obviously don't have insurance, so they don't come to the doctor as soon, so they come to the hospital a lot sicker than you would see in patients in the suburbs. Um, so I um, worked at a hospital in the emergency department called D.C. General, uh, where I worked there mainly as an agency nurse or temp nurse at the time while I was working uh, full time uh, in the burbs. And that my goal was to get that experience of that inner city stuff. And so I did that for several, several years. And, and then I came to the Washington Hospital Center and I worked there in their ICU for a couple of years. Uh, in a CV ICU, where again, I got the exposure to, to VADS. And so uh, I had the exposure actually, and I worked at Fairfax in the suburbs. And then I came to the hospital center in Washington, D.C., and got that uh, experience again. And from there, in 1991, 90, I uh, transferred to the flight team, which was in the same hospital, and just kind of um, took that on. When I was um, at the Washington Hospital Center, I worked for MedStar. Uh, MedStar uh, is a flight program out of Washington, D.C. I worked there for 20 years. 10 years, I was the flight nurse, uh, just punching the clock, doing flights, knocking out seeing flights and inter-facility transports. And then uh, in 2001, right after 9-11, no, before 9-11, I became the uh, chief flight nurse of the program, and I was there for 10 years before I left to come to Air Methods in 2010. Um, back in 1997, 1996, the hospital had uh, two patients uh, that were on VADS, uh, mainly something called a HeartMate XVE, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And what they did, these two patients had been in the hospital over a year, so the hospital decided, we got to get let these people out of here. And so they decided to um, 
discharge them. And I'm not sure at the time that this was F a FDA approved to be discharged, di dischargeable or make the patients ambulatory. Uh -huh. The hospital discharged them. And what they did is train the flight team to be the expert to go get them if something happened. And so that's why this whole part of this VAD training really exploded in the pre-hospital world for me. And so as the leader of the pack, and as I became chief, you really had to know it and know it well. Right. And so uh, we did a couple of flights with these patients. They flew back occasionally, but nothing major and until September 11th, 2001, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we had a, a patient that had somewhat of a bad failure. And it's rarely that you see bad failures, and we'll talk about that in a second. And so we're able to fly uh, to get uh, this young man in the suburbs of Washington with a, a Apache escort, my ad, <laughs> <laughs> which was great. Uh, that was the start of it. And so that's my experience in a little nutshell of bads and critical care. Now, didn't you invent or uh, invent some type of a color coding system uh, to help practitioners, clinicians, uh, you know, identify the different types of VADs um, and, and get that published with the different uh, companies? Yeah, I, I did. And I, I'll tell you, Eric, uh, it was an idea that I sat in the office and just came up with. Um, and I, it came up back in, in 2000, uh, mid 2005, 6, 7, in there. It was the whole VAD thing, it, it had started to explode. And it started to explode because uh, VADs became smaller. Um, they became uh, really different because uh, instead of the patients, the, the newer generations no longer had a pulsatile flow, it had continuous flow, which changes the whole dynamic to how you take care of a patient. You know, because there's no pulse oximetry, there's no blood pressure, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, it changed everything. And so uh, we had five big hospitals in the area that were putting many, many bad patients out in the community. And let's, they had John Hopkins in Baltimore, the University of Maryland in Baltimore. You had Fairfax Hospital, which is called Nova, actually, Nova Hospital, Nova Fairfax Hospital in Fairfax, Virginia. You had the Washington Hospital Center, which is in D.C. And then you had MCV in Richmond. And then you had also University of Virginia. So you had all these hospitals that were putting in VADs, multiple VADs a week, and putting them out in the community. So um, what happened was is that it uh, forced pre-hospital and everybody else to learn them because now they were walking the streets <laughs> and having issues and we had to take care of them and bring them back. So by looking at the, it was so many people putting the devices out, so many different hospitals, and there were so many different types of devices on the market, it was hard to keep up to learn a specific device. So what I came up with is 10 questions. I came up with 10 questions that everybody should like know um, when caring for a bad patient, specifically for pre-hospital. And so this allowed people to say, the first question was, someone, everybody wants to know, can I do CPR? So I came up with, <laughs> that was the first question I had. So I did this on, uh, on, device, on all the devices. And what I noticed is that a lot of devices, although had different names, they all kind of fall into the same kind of category. The ones that had pulsatile flow acted one way, and ones that had continuous flow acted another way. And then there was a total artificial heart, which is a total, total different animal, that they all act similarly, yet they were all, all different devices. And so these 10 questions I came up with, started training our staff with and, and, and using it as a, as a way from, for them to get the patient from point A to point B. And then so uh, me and a young lady named Tanya Elliott, and Tanya Elliott is the VAD coordinator for the Washington Hospital Center now. She was with Inova Fairfax back at the time. And uh, I was getting my master's in critical care, and she was my preceptor one day. And so uh, we met, we had a great conversation, and she was actually the nurse who I flew in September 11, 2001. She was the VAG coordinator that I flew the patient too. So kind of wild that we kind of came back together to meet each other. And so um, with that said, um, we um, started talking, and I said, we, we, we need to come up with a way to uh, work together with all these hospitals, with all these patients, because we're making a lot of mistakes, you know. And so uh, she used her clout to contact uh, all the different VAG coordinators of those hospitals I named a few minutes ago, and they all came, all came to a meeting you know, to figure out what we're going to do you know, to help EMS to battle this 
big issue with bads in the community. And so probably the third meeting, I came in and I said, hey, I got these 10 questions. And I said, this is what EMS needs to know. We don't need to know all the stuff that a VAT coordinator needs to know. We just don't know the big stuff, you know. If it slows down, what do I do? You know, how do I change the batteries? How long do they last? These the simple questions. Uh, so on these things. And I said, it'll be great if you guys could color code the devices based on how, uh, the name of it, you know. And so that then we can take this color coding system and match it with the 10 questions or specifics about the device. And that way EMS could quickly track it. And so what we did then is they started putting on a little tag on the controller, which sits on the waist of every device in the Washington, D.C. area. HeartMate XP was, was yellow and the orange was a HeartMate 2 and hardware was purple. So the, everybody had a color and the tag on it, it had the name of the device, who put it in and the phone number of the bag created. But the color was important to EMS because they went to this guy that we created for free. Well, lo and behold, Eric, let me tell you this. Uh, uh, sure enough, about a year into it, um, Thoratech, which is like the Microsoft or VADS, they came in and they wanted to adopt the color coding system to all their devices uh, across the world. Not just the United States, not just the, the entire world. So it was like amazing, amazing, amazing thing. So what you see now is in every kit that you open around the world uh, that has a HeartMate 2 device, and we'll talk about in a second, is a orange medical alert, alert bracelet that matches the color coding system that came up. And that was the claim to fame um, from the VAT world. So um, it's been helpful, you know, and people can, eat. it's free, you know, I didn't get paid for it. It was a patient safety initiative. And so um, is it something that me and the group, because the group did a lot of work on this, those VAT coordinators at those hospitals, I uh, did a lot of work to, to get this off the ground, so it's been very successful. Well, that's really cool. Well, that's cool when you, you know, you have a passion. I remember, you know, when I first met you and, and you, you kind of told the story and, you know, I remember you uh, discussing, you know, when you have a passion for something like that, you know, immerse yourself in it and, and become the leader in that in that field. And, you know, I've I've uh, I've tried to do the same thing. So. You know, for those listeners out there, you know, Alan has been, like I said, he's, he's the type of guy for me that um, he always asks me the tough questions. When I think I've got something figured out, when I think I have a project completed, um, he will ask me some question that just throws a wrench in it every single time. And, and it's a good thing because he keeps me accountable and he, and he, you know, brings me to a higher level. So I just want to say that, you know, that's, that's a, a big deal to me. I need those type of people in my life. Um, so let's jump into uh, the VADs as far as why are VADs implanted? What, what's the big purpose? Um, what's the difference of somebody getting a VAD versus maybe going a different route? Okay. Uh, there are three main reasons that people get a VAD. The first one is a bridge to a transplant, a heart transplant. And that's basically they put it in, they allow you to um, function and uh, perfuse your other organs for a certain time frame, get in better health to be able to uh, uh, stand the rigor of having a heart transplant. Perfect example, uh, Vice President Cheney. He had a HeartMate 2 device for almost two years. People thought that once he got the device that he would be pushed to the top of the transplant list. Oh, no. <laughs> he actually waited like everybody else. And then he got his about two years long, I think about two years, that he waited before he got his. And he's been in great health with his heart transplant. The second reason people get it is called bridge to recovery. And you usually see that in uh, all kinds of patients, but mainly in patients with pe people who have postpartum cardiomyopathy and they have really bad heart failure. And so sometimes they will put in an LVAD and allow the heart to take a vacation for a couple of days, three, four, five days, explant the device, take the device out, sew up that myocardium, and then the heart's fantastic because it's had a little break and they've fixed a lot of other systems. And so that's the second reason. But the biggest one we see now, nowadays, is something called destination therapy. And destination therapy means that you have so many comorbidities that, and I'll give you a hint to a heart transplant, because a heart transplant has to be those great patients that take pills all the time and on top of things, and not a lot of things that cause this, this heart to fail, because you, you know, you, they, they, 
first time could be your only time. Uh, but with this, these VAT, they can give people who have uh, a lot of comorbidities an opportunity to live a, live a little bit longer. And so, um, and those are the three big reasons they have it. So when you say bridge to recovery, um, one of my questions is uh, a physician may go LVAD, but if it's a bridge to recovery, why would they go LVAD versus a balloon pump or an Impella device? Yeah, um, balloon pumps and uh, Impella, Impella will improve cardiac flow, it's forward flow. Um, and uh, balloon pump just basically the primary reason is to perfuse the coronaries. But on the fat, on the other hand, it has a um, can produce better cardiac output a little bit longer than an impeller. Impeller is just for a certain amount of days and then it's removed. It can't stand, else it can't. They don't see those in for long term. A bad can be a lot longer for recovery. So if, if recovery period is extended. Okay. So um, those are used most often for um, baths. But you do see impellers, so don't get me wrong. You do see those, but not for people who have real bad um, heart failure or in destination therapy. Okay. You know, All right. uh, so for, for those uh, out there that listen, that you know, we have listeners that, that work ground critical care. Uh, we have just uh, uh, ground paramedics that are trying to bridge to the flight environment, and obviously we have a, a big HEMS community. Um, as far as transport considerations with uh, the VAS, is there anything specific that we want to look out for? I know that's probably a pretty objective question, that, but... That's a, that's a good question. For the ground part of it is uh, in the air is that if a patient has a their own console, meaning their own console console that uh, drives the device, uh, there used to be a time when when you if if you plugged it in, then start up your ambulance or start up your aircraft, then it could produce a, a shortage on a device. So now they fix that, so there's no ch- no possibility of that happening. So you have to worry about that part of it. The second part of it is that for um, transport on ground, like here in the mountains in, in Colorado, uh, that's altitude issues. Mm-hmm. Or the, uh, in the in an aircraft, uh, you don't have to worry about altitude at all, except if the device is pneumatic. And pneumatic meaning uh, pulsatile flow. And those vi- those devices are the ones that produce a pulse. And that's like the heart made XVE, the Thorntech PVAD, IVAD, or even the total artificial heart. Those are all pulsatile flow. Uh, the continuous devices, which you see most often, and that's probably nine out of ten, ten of them out there, those have no transport considerations related to altitude uh, or vibration or anything like that. So we've kind of um, done, they've done really well with that part of it. So wh- why would a physician go with a pulsatile flow device versus continuous flow? What would be the considerations? So uh, that one, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't know on that one, Eric. That would be more of the cardiologist and the... Okay. Cardi- cardi- thoracic surgeons, but there have been instances where patients, uh, just uh, two cases I know, are patients who have clotted, clotted uh, off a continuous flow device and had to be switched to a pulsatile device because they just wouldn't work on them, uh, that particular patient. You know, so uh, uh, I'm sure there's reasons, I just don't know those. And as far as altitude considerations with the pulsatile flow, is there a specific ceiling that you want to stay under? Yeah, the thing about the pulsatile flow devices is that um, what it affects is the if you wouldn't have an emergency, and in 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 emergencies with patients with pulsatile flow, you need a a, a to manual uh, run a device by what's called a bulb syringe to do it. The altitude is going to affect the air in that bulb syringe. So, right. well, yeah, it's just like a balloon pump in that volume. Every thousand feet on the way, two thousand feet on the way up, one thousand feet on the way down, you have to reconstitute the air inside the bulb to keep that same cardiac output that you want to have. And so that's the key thing to remember on that one. But that's only on the pulsatile flow devices or the new or the pneumatic run devices. Okay. All right, cool. So as far as the different manufacturers out there, are there specific manufacturers? You keep uh, talking about the HeartMate 2. Are there, are, is that the most popular manufacturer that, that we're going to probably see in the transport environment? Yeah, the, the big two is HeartMate 2 by Thoratech and Heartware. Uh, Heartware is like Apple. HeartMate 2 is like uh, Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, Microsoft, right. Those are okay. the two big ones out there, yeah. Okay. And, um, uh, and of course, they're always ever changing, and there's always somebody new on the market 
Um, and the other one that's making little ground is the total artificial heart. Not as big numbers the way you see on the Heartware and Heartmate 2, um, but you, um, there are those out there, you know. But uh, those are the two big ones. So based on your color coding system like that, uh, that's, that's pretty much how you're going to identify the two different manufacturers. Uh, Correct. You're right. If you see a patient with a device, you look for the medical alert bracelet. It should be color coded. If not, you look on that little fanny pack. The fanny pack is where they have the controller. The controller is the computer of the device. And you look at that, it should be a, uh, a color coded index card with the name of the laminated index card with the name of the device, uh, who put it in and a phone number and that color matches this EMS guide. You refer to the guide and then you're able to uh, figure out what to do, one of the things to do, hopefully what to do. Okay. Um, as far as patient assessment considerations, um, is there anything that you uh, would recommend um, our crews out there, how, how should we approach patient c considerations as far as, uh, you know, you, you, you show up on scene, transfer, Obviously, uh, these patients probably are, are great historians or their family, you know, are, are really good at understanding the LVADs and they could probably teach um, or t discuss that. Is that correct? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Eric. And so the first thing is when you go to the patient is airway and breathing first, you know, no doubt, airway and breathing, breathing. But, <laughs> but very quickly, you know, if you can do BVM, that's considered an airway, right? right. You know, it doesn't have to have a, a tube in, but you have to check C quickly because C is the VAD. And if there's alarm going off, then you have to fix it. If there's uh, and the, one, one of the first things you ever do is always check the connections to see that everything connected to, if the alarms are going off. That could be a simple fix. And then if there's alarming, alarm is going off, then you have to, to troubleshoot the alarms. Uh, but it's airway and breathing first. And then uh, once you've done that, you look at see if there are any, any alarms, then you have to determine whether or not it's working, right? Mm -hmm. And the only way you can determine whether it's working is that you get your stethoscope and listen. You put it right uh, at the, below the apex, you know, mm -hmm. and listen for the whirling sound. Okay. You know, if it's a continuous flow device, it's just a little whirling sound. And once you hear that, that is one of the only ways you can tell that it's working. Now, if it's a pulsatile device, you're going to hear it. It's just like, you know, a loud, you would hear it clearly. Uh, but it's continuous slow devices. You have to use a stethoscope, and then you will hear the whirling sound. The other thing to notice is that once you determine that it's, it's working, you also have to determine whether or not it has power. And by looking at the power source, it's like... Um, Four little dashes they'll have on a, it's like a battery that has a little dat, red, I mean, that red, um, green dashes, each representing 25%, and that tells you if this has power. And so uh, look for the green light for battery and look at your stethoscope and see if it's working, and that will help you. On the newer HeartMate 2 device, it's called a pocket controller. They have like a little whirling sign, uh, sign a thing that going around and around that tells you that it's working. Similar to what you see on your computer when your computer is looking for uh, another web address, circling around looking for it. Yeah, yeah. So remember what he said is that most uh, devices now that are implanted are going to be a continuous flow device. They're not going to be pulsatile. So we got to remember that you're not going to be able to obtain a radio pulse. You're not going to be able to you know, get a blood pressure and things like that um, like we normally would. So you need to actually auscultate at the apex um, in that situation and identify very quickly if you have any type of flow. Right. The other thing, Eric, since you mentioned that, is that when you're assessing a patient, remember, be very careful with scissors. Because if the patient's unresponsive, they don't have a pulse, they don't have a blood pressure, and they say they're agonal breathing. And we may start compressions, you know, uh, or may cut their clothes off. We have to be very careful not to cut those drive lines that are wrapped around the patient's waist that can easily make you have a bad day. Or the patient. <laughs> yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> I know, that would be bad. The other thing to remember, too, is um, that don't use consciousness as a way to determine whether or not the device is working. Just get in the habit of always listening every single time to make sure you hear that whirling sound, uh, for one thing. And just go by old school. Look for temperature and skin, skin temperature and whether someone's diaphoretic or pale. Use the old school uh, ways of determining whether or not a patient is being perfused. The other thing um, I would suggest to do is, you know, start an, it's okay to start an IV. It's also okay to, if the patient's conscious, ask him, you know, uh, how do you operate this thing, you know? 
how do you change the battery? You know, and they, believe me, they have to know it like a back of the hand to, to be discharged from the hospital. And they have a family member that has to know it well or a, a roommate that knows it well. So uh, whoever's there, don't be afraid to say, hey, you know, um, how do you change the batteries? Right? If this slows down, what do I do? You know, ask the patient, uh, can I do CPR with this thing in? They know that information because they have to know it. And so if you get that information from them before they become unconscious, it would be very helpful to everybody involved, you know? All right. So that's, uh, that's great stuff. I, I think, you know, a lot of people that I've talked to, you know, they're, they're uncomfortable at LVADs. Um, you know, I, I haven't, I have never, you know, I've done this 23 years. I've never, ever transported or flown an LVAD patient. So, you know, for me, this is a learning experience as well. Um, one of the biggest questions that I always get is, can you perform external compressions? So what do you, what do you say to that? Um, that's an interesting question. What the, what the manufacturers, manuf- I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> what they say is this. They say is external compressions, they say CPR actually, external compressions are contraindicated. Okay. But there may be instances where uh, compressions are warrant- warranted. What is that? That's like schizophrenic, right? Right, absolutely. Right. So what they're saying is that they're telling you, Probably not a good idea to do them because when you do them, it pulls out the device out of the uh, the ventricle. You know, it can it can pull it out of the ventricle, and then the patient, of course, hemorrhages to death. And so, what they're saying is, and what we say a lot of times is, it just treat the patient as severe heart failure. You know, put them on those inotropes of epi, a dibutamine, a dopamine, something that gets them squeezed, rather than doing the compressions. However, however, however. Whatever the local VAT center says do on these patients is what you should do. Like some, let's say John Hopkins, for instance, when I was in that area, they said, well, what difference does it make? They're dead anyway, you know, or almost dead. Why not take the risk of doing it? Which we understand. You go across the river, Potomac, and you go on the Virginia side, and the Virginia people are saying, nope, don't do it, because we want to be able to rush that patient to the OR, explant and exchange the device, or restart it at the hospital. And so you got two different thoughts on how to manage it, but it's truly based on that specific center who put it in. And so it kind of puts us in the bind because we have no idea what that center is because we don't know where they come from. Take Arizona. I was just in Arizona um, last week. And Arizona gets a lot of snowbirds from the north, right? Yes. And so those patients with VADs in the north, where they come? Down to Arizona <laughs> for those three, four months of winter, right? And so... Um, you have no idea who put it in or anything like that. So only the patient kind of knows. So it makes it difficult. So uh, you could always err on the uh, right side and say, well, just do CPR. And that way you always on the right side of doing what's right for the patient. But if somebody says you shouldn't have done it, oh, well, you didn't know. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So I agree. I think, you know, if you don't know, always err on the side of caution and, and, uh, I uh, appreciate you answering that question. Uh, let's see. If if we can't perform external compressions, is there, is there an external device or a hand pump that these elevads are capable of, of, of having applied? Yeah, with the continuous flow devices, there is not. Um, you just uh, don't have anything for that. For the pneumatic devices, like the HeartMate XVE, the PVAD, and the IVAD by Thortec, um, you d- and also um, that one, you do have those two those devices, you do have a hand pump to do it. But there's not many of those devices walking the streets in the United States. It's very, very, very few. So if it's continuous flow devices, you do not have that option. Okay. All right. As far as, uh, you know, you've talked about alarms. Is there a specific alarm that uh, goes off if you do have a, a reduced flow or uh, for some reason um, the elevad's not performing like it should be? Yeah. Uh, on every device, the, the, all the VADs, the low flow alarm alarms when the liters per minute gets to 2.0 or below. And it's called a red heart alarm. And that's your most critical alarm. It's just uh, it's a violent <laughs> sound that the bad makes when that red alarm goes off. And so uh, one of the things that they teach the patients to do is um, drink some fluids and change the controller. Because it may be the controller. The controller is the mind of the whole device. Uh, for us in pre-hospital, we want to start a line 
and give fluids. Bats love volume, 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 volume. They have to run by volume. Uh, they need that right ventricle too to push volume to the other side. So volume is really important to a bat. Um, the goals usually on um, uh, on those patients are blood pressure is like a map of 80. And to get that blood pressure, you have to use a Doppler. And so you don't use a non-invasive, uh, a Doppler. You put a blood pressure cuff, cuff on. The first sound that you hear, it is your map. That is your map right there, the first sound you hear. Now, if you, if you don't have a Doppler, you can use a non-invasive. It's just not the best evidence to give you that best pressure. It's, it's going to give you a map, a systolic and diastolic, and it's going to give you a map. And you can use that map, but it is best, the best evidence says, to use a Doppler. And so if you don't have a Doppler, definitely um, uh, use one. And what was the question again you, before that? You said, ask me. Um, we were talking about if the, the device actually slows down if you have a, a yeah. flow. Yeah, and the other things you can do besides volume is is to add an inotrope uh, to give it that squeeze. Uh, if none of those things work, then you have to do what's called a control exchange, and that is nerve wracking because you have to take the computer off from one and put a brand new one on. And so that in that field guide, it tells you step by step by step what to do to change a controller. So, do these patients actually always are they always equipped with a second backup controller? Very good question, Eric. Yeah, every bad patient always, always is hopefully is carrying a travel bag. That travel bag is has extra batteries and extra controllers in it, and also has information about the patient inside. So wherever the patient is, if there's a car accident and you know it's a bad somewhere in that car, uh, is that travel bag that needs to come with the patients? Can't if they go to facility. Um, they, you, they, they, you really can't help them without that bag because that has the equipment in it. Now, is there anything when the, these alarms go off um, and, and they're, they're going off, is there anything that the clinician can do to actually speed up the flow? Uh, no. The only thing you can do to speed up the flow is increase the cardiac output, and that's either by giving volume or sudden inotrope. But I would always go with volume first, and volume can fix a lot of things. Uh, not be overzealous and give liters and liters and liters, not by any means, but just give them a little at a time and just wait for that right point where um, that bat likes that to flow at, you know, based on a set of volume. Right. So that, I think that's pretty interesting for, for those out, listeners out there. If you, you know, you understand balloon pump therapy, balloon pump therapy, um, a lot of times, um, you know, you have obviously a left-sided failure. And one of the things we always teach is we teach that any aortic insufficiency whatsoever are always preload dependent. So it sounds like LVAD patients are also preload dependent. Is that correct, Alan? Yeah, they are preload dependent. And so that right ventricle is key to success of that bad. You will find that bad patients take huge doses of Cialis and what's the other one? Um, Viagra. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Those two drugs, they take huge, huge doses. Not like normal doses that um, people will take take for erectile dysfunction. We're talking like a whole 24-hour dose at one dose. And their whole goal is that is to dilate the pulmonary vasculature so that you don't develop pulmonary hypertension. Because once you develop pulmonary hypertension, that can lead to RV failure, which is known as coral pulmonale. And so we don't want RV failure because that that right ventricle is so important to feeding the, the VAD on the left side. So you may see instances where a patient may have in another VAD in an the, in the RVAD. So you have a left, R, LVAD, left ventricular, or an RVAD on the right side if someone has a um, problem with uh, the RV. And that's called a BIVAD, you know, one on each side. Interesting. Yeah, and, and, and we, you know, we did a podcast uh, a month and a half ago regarding pulmonary embolism, and we discussed the importance of that, that right ventricle and, and actually the diastolic aspect of the pulmonary artery and, and th that the right ventricle can't handle those huge increases in pressure, that it's so important to, you know, the preload aspect to, to make sure we don't have any um, infarct or blow out of that right ventricle so we continually have the, the correct afterload. So. Um, obviously, same type of aspect here is we have to make sure that our, our preload is, is optimal, uh, that we don't have excessive pressures, and that, that gives us the proper afterload. Right. So uh, for these patients, so if you do have a patient that arrests, um, if I'm understanding correctly, basically it's going to be a LVAD failure is essentially what's going to happen. I mean, most probably. Um, it's not going to be, are you going to have any 
a way to monitor um, if this patient's in an arrhythmia, V-fib, V-tac, anything like that? Will they have arrhythmias like that? Well, actually, it's very rare that you see an L, uh, LVAT failure. It's okay. usually due to a lot of other medical conditions. Patients come to hospital mainly for uh, neurological changes such as stroke. Okay. Big one is anemia because, you know, you've got a continuous flow. How does that affect red blood cells and that whole thing? Analysis, yeah. Like, yeah, by going through this kind of propeller-like axle flow kind of, uh, you know, continuous flow. So those are the two big ones. And so, um, or they come in dehydrated, you know, or like you mentioned arrhythmias. But very rarely do they have VAD issues. Patients can be VAD patients. Um, electrical function is different from mechanical. Mechanical is control 100% by the VAD and preload, right? 100%. That means your electrical function is totally different from the VAD. That means you will find patients in VTAC and VFib, and that can be totally stable watching television, right? <laughs> and so it becomes a concern to us because we've never seen anybody with VFib sitting there talking to you about anything. Right. So the learning point on this is anytime you see a patient with VTAC and VFib, if they're stable, you don't do one single thing. You just sit there and get them to the hospital that puts the device in pretty quickly. What you could do, however, is interview the patient. So, you know, right now they're conscious. You go, so how do I change these batteries? You know, <laughs> if it slows down, what do I do? You start getting the information out of the patient right. because if they become unstable and then unresponsive, you have all the information from the patient, you know, the patient's family. So, but those are the key things to remember. VTAC and VFib, the patients can be stable with those rhythms and you should do nothing but transport the patient. Now, if they become unstable, you do whatever your protocol says to do regarding an unstable patient in VTAC or, or VFib. Um, so keep that in, in mind. Okay. Can these patients, obviously, if they become bradycardic, can, they, can we paste these patients externally? Yeah, you can paste them. And pacing doesn't hurt the VAD at all. It's, it's, not, it's, it's grounded. But what a, the pacing does do is that it mainly is done for the right ventricle if it's become bradycardic to make sure that preload keeps dumping into um, the, 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 the left side. The other thing you mentioned about arrhythmias is that uh, a lot of times you see VTAC and VFib uh, when, when I've gone, and even um, my program here has gone to get patients, and they've been in VTAC, VFib, you'll see that the hospitals do everything right. They uh, give the patients magnesium. They give the patients calcium. They give them potassium. They put them on Lido. They give them amiodarone. They give them every single drug that you can name to try to fix this arrhythmia. But this is what m most of the time the problem is, is that it's something called a suction event. A suction event happens when the ventricles are full and then the patients become dehydrated. And I said before, they come in for all kind of, you know, uh, things like that related to dehydration, not feeling well and not eating. And so when they get de de dehydrated, the cannula that sits into the left ventricle starts to suck on the side of the ventricle, causing runs of VTAC and VFib. And that's how you get those arrhythmias. So I'm saying one of the first things you should probably try on a patient that stable with having arrhythmias is 250 cc's of normal saline or lactate arrhythmias. Simple volume. Simple volume. It fills up the ventricle and then it stops sucking on the side and your arrhythmia is gone. Patient's fixed. Discharged. Yeah. That's, so, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. So keep that in mind. All right. Well, as far as uh, in summary, is there anything specifically that we haven't covered that you think is relevant um, that, that our, our listeners would benefit from? Yeah, so this is review the big things. The big things is that uh, pulse oximetry is inaccurate because it's continuous flow device. So you have to go old school and look to see it about perfusion, 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 all those parameters for perfusion. The other thing is blood pressure is uh, most likely absent. Now, there are some patients who have uh, native heart dysfunction. That's beating okay that you might get a systolic and diastolic pressure. But still, go by the map. The map is done with a Doppler. The Doppler is the best evidence that tells us that what is the true blood pressure of the patient. But then again, you look at perfusion. The second thing is always determine is the device is working. Anytime you call the hospital, that bad coordinator's number who's on there, the first question they're going to ask you, any alarms going off? Yes, no, right? And the second thing is, is it working? And all you can say is working is that get the stethoscope, you listen, and you hear the whirling sound, but you clearly hear it working, right? The other thing to remember is they're going to ask you, does it have power, 
right? And you determine whether it has power by seeing if there's a light, green light, battery light on that says that it has uh, power. Uh, getting back to the arrhythmias, VTAC, VFib. Remember that they can be, patients can be stable with those rhythms. So what do you want the first thing you want to do is volume. If they're asymptomatic, you get volume. If they're symptomatic, you do what you normally do. But just still remember, volume can um, prevent that suction uh, event that's happening. And the next thing is the color coding system. The color coding system is either uh, a color coded medical alert, uh, medical alert bracelet or it's a color coded tag on the patient's fanny pack where this uh, controller is, is, is uh, sitting. The other thing is that this is a best practice by JCO. They adopted it back in 2010 uh, as, a, as a best practice for pre-hospital and VAG creators. And most uh, hospitals that put in VAGs use it, not all, not all. And so uh, we continue to make progress through the uh, VAG coordinators association, I call that. <laughs> but those guys, I call that, that's what I call them. They're working to uh, um, to make sure that everybody's aware of it. It was an article done in 2009 in a journal of transplantation. It talks about VADs and the color coded system. So this is evidence based practice. It's not, something, I mean, it's something I created. Right. It's helped create, but um, it is definitely evidence based practice that's written in a journal of transplantation, you know? So I think it's June 2010 is in that article, that one. So as far as documentation goes, um, what types of things are we, uh, should we focus on? Uh, auscultation and identifying that we have a whirling sound, and then um, as far as identifying a map pressure, you know, you've talked a lot about using the Doppler, that's the best option. What's the best location? Are we still using the AC, or are we using the radio as far as our Doppler placement? Yeah, best location is AC, absolutely. And documentation, you hit, it, hit the nail right on the head, document the whirling sound that tells everybody that was working the next thing you document if there's a green light that has battery power now if you have the heart mate device the heart mate device has all the information such as wattage flow uh, and rpms all on device itself all that stuff is documented and also document if there is any alarms uh on on those those things the other thing that's helpful but i find um in um, my chart review from my company is a lot of times you won't see any mention of what kind of divided device it is. They just say LVAD because, <laughs> you know, people don't know them yeah. and they go, is that an LVAD? And I'll go, well, which one? Right. You know, and this was an LVAD. So there's multiple kind and just look on uh, the controller. It tells you the, the brand name of it. So this is the, it's easy to find out. Okay. Well, I don't know if there's really anything else that you want to discuss as far as the LVADs go. I think this has been an excellent podcast. Um, are you all right with uh, putting your email address down if anybody has any questions? Um, or, or we can always forward those questions to me and I can forward them to you. It's whatever you'd like. Yeah, you can reach me at Aaron Wolf, A I R W O L F E, the number seven, at gmail.com. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's a cool name. I remember as a kid watching Air Wolf. That's the first thing I saw. Somebody, a young man named Gene sent me a shirt that he found in Texas that had Airwolf on it. Yeah. And he sent it to me just a couple months ago. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Well, Alan, I want to, again, thank you for taking your time out of the evening. I know, you, you know you're know you a busy guy and then you know, a long day at work. And so I just want to say thanks. We've been trying to hook up on this podcast for probably a year now. I sent him this uh, uh, request about a year ago so it's pretty cool that we were able to hook up tonight again if anybody has any questions um, i'll put his contact information in the show notes and um, i'll uh, reference Go ahead. yeah and one thing i wanted to add you can find those ems guys on www.mylvad.com and it's free you just download them to which device you want and uh, they're updated every year so free Probably. Speaking of that, have they put those in any of the new standard critical care field guides that a lot of us carry? Uh, no. But actually, one person asked me a uh, while ago, uh, would I add it to their app, uh, the, some app they had, some critical care app? And I said, sure, but I never got a chance to they kind of do it because it's, you know, it's comp a little bit more complex than I thought. Right. Uh, you know, if I just give you information, you put it in. No, no, no. It's a lot bit more, a lot bit, lot more complex. So um, that's... A, possibility i would love to put that on the app to make it easy for people to get um but i'm not that person to do that the other thing is 
EMS guy, you know, is carried around in your ambulance or your uh, flight suit or on your uh, phone, it's easy to access and easy to get to. So, all right. Well, again, I just want to thank Alan and, and uh, thank everybody for the following and the listenership. And uh, we will talk to you next time. This has been a production of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, leading the way in pre hospital critical care and emergency medicine education. 